on the 1st of January 1919, a night that should have been full of joy of a homecoming turned into the most unimaginable tragedy. The story of the ILR is one of the saddest and most emotive stories I have ever read. The ship that would eventually be called the ILR, Gallic for the Eagle, was first built in 1881. Her purpose was to be a luxury yacht, but in the First World War she was used as a patrol ship. The First World War had had an awful effect on Harrison Lewis. 6,000 men had headed off to fight and a 1,000 had already been killed. That fateful New Year's Eve and the New Year's Day would take another massive toll on the islands. It had been a struggle for the hundreds of survivors of the Great War to get as far as they had. Uh, they met up at the Kyle of Loch Alsh to board two ships. There was a McBrien steam mail boat that was going to take people to Sky and Tarbert and the HM ILR, which was bound for Stornoway. The ILR was ill-equipped to carry the men that would board. It had room for a hundred. It had 80 life jackets and two lifeboats, and there was now 284 men on board. It is said that the captain expressed his worry over this, though he did still set sail for Stornoway that evening around half past seven. It was nearly midnight when the ILR reached probably about 12 miles off the coast of Stornoway. It was to be intercepted by the Budding Rose, an armed drifter that was to guide it into Stornoway Harbour as it had never docked there before. Despite this, by 1am the ILR was drifting far too far east and was heading towards the Beast of Holm. Beast of Holm is a particularly jagged, nasty outcrop just outside the Bay of Stornoway. The ILR failed to react to the lights on the Beast of Holm, instead struck it, floundered and by 2am was sunk just 20 yards from the shore. These men would have saw the lights of their homes as disaster struck. There would also have been a lot of families gathering close to the harbour, waiting for their return. The lifeboat was overfilled and capsized within a very short time. If it hadn't been for the likes of John McLeod, who managed to fix a line on hawser to shore and guide in 40 souls, the death toll could have been a whole lot worse. There were 39 men who did manage to survive the icy cold waters and that would have been really impaired by the fact their fatigues would have been wool and they would have had heavy, heavy army boots on. The other 201 souls, in some reports 205, most were eventually washed up on the Sandwick Bay and beaches. It is said that children's toys also strewn the beaches, obviously for the soldiers' children on their return. And one poor soul, they find an engagement ring in his pocket. He was obviously going home to pop the question. Some family members were obviously so traumatised by this that they literally lost their speech for months. In fact, there is one lady, her granddaughter has expressed recently that her grandmother used to lose her speech every New Year's Eve. Six weeks after the disaster, a man from Great Burnera had been dreaming that there was a body floating in Glunog Bay. He got up early the next morning and headed down to the bay with the authorities to find that the body floating was actually his son's. The youngest man to perish was David MacDonald, a mere 17 year old young man from Aberdeen who was a signal boy on the ship. Others included two sailors from the Isle of Wight and three Londoners who were part of the yacht crew. There was also a Fred McCarthy who had been a bell rigger in his hometown of Hartlepool. On our trip, we also visited the Stornoway War Memorial, which is really quite moving with the lists and lists of names of the fallen. Lewis and Harris suffered the highest proportion of deaths 
anywhere in the UK. The village of Hugh lost five souls alone. Three were the brothers Macaulay. Most families on Harrison Lewis lost one family member, be it a son, a brother or a father, though there were families who lost much more than that. The metal plaques that stand almost like a stone circle at the top of the hill at Stornoway are really quite a poignant reminder of how many people went to the Great War and how few survived. Whatever an inquiry may turn up, it wouldn't bring back the souls from that night. The inquiry obviously was kept secret due to Official Secrets Act and that, but in 1970 it did turn out that since no Navy officers had survived, no blame could be apportioned. What we can say is some of the facts of the matter. The Royal Navy carried out an investigation in 1919 that was wholly private. The Royal Navy also downgraded it from a court-martial to a court of inquiry, which would negate as much blame on their part. It's also worth mentioning that the Admiralty put the wreck for sale, not 15 days after the disaster, and while 80 souls were still lost and unaccounted for. On the 1st of January 2019, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, Prince Charles and various dignitaries from the Hebrides went out to the ILR monument to commemorate the centenary of this horrific disaster. To commemorate the disaster, a stone was collected from the village or town of everyone who perished in the ILR disaster and another cairn was made in their honour. I shall leave you with a picture of it. <laughs> 